This morning we're finishing up that uh, sermon series on parables. Uh, we've talked about some different themes. We've talked about the reality that we need to get all of the things in our life that are of more importance than Jesus. We need to get those things out of our life. We've talked about the fact that we need to use the things that God gives us. Uh, last week we talked about our need to forgive. We've talked about what it means to work in God's kingdom. We've talked about all those things. In all of those themes, each of the parables had a different lesson or different, different theme. Uh, in all of those parables, the common thing that stood out to me in all of the parables is God's graciousness. They often, most of the parables start out, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then we're told about the king, or we're told about a master, or we're told about a landowner. And in all of the parables, what we see is that the king, which stands, which is symbolic of God, the king is completely gracious and completely merciful and completely loving. And that's in every parable. And that has just kind of captured me as we've, we've gone along. This morning's parable talks, we're going to talk again about that graciousness, but it's a graciousness that we need to uh, exhibit and display. And it's a graciousness that frankly makes me really uncomfortable. I don't want to do it. And so we're going to look at that. We're looking at the parable of the weeds and the parable of the net this morning. It's in Matthew 13. And so it's kind of because we're looking at two different parables and actually Jesus comes back. That's confusing, but we're going to be looking at Matthew 13, 24 to 30, 36 to 43, and verses 47 to 52. So if you would, please stand. I know you just sat down. At each side, we stand for the reading of Scripture just in recognition that these are, are God's words for us. So Matthew 13, 24 to 30, 36 to 43, and 47 to 52. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow until the harvest. And at that time, I'll tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into the barn. Jumping down to verse 36. And then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. Jesus answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of the field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. Would you pray with me? God, as we look at your word this morning, I pray that you would indeed give us new treasures as well as old treasures, that you would help us to see from your storeroom, from your house, uh, from your uh, abundance of gifts, would you help us to see what you want us to see in this passage this morning? Guide us as we go, Lord. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. <clears throat> so in English, the word weeds is that kind of this general term for things that grow where, where we don't want things to grow or things that come up where we don't want them to come up. That's what, that's what weeds are for us. 
Jesus doesn't use our word weeds. Jesus uses a word that's a particular weed. It's a kind of ryegrass. And in the parts of the world where this ryegrass grows, this kind of ryegrass is often called false wheat. Thanks, guys. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this kind of this kind of ryegrass is called false wheat because it looks so much like wheat. In fact, it's actually hard to tell. It's, it's called Darnell. It's hard to tell Darnell apart from wheat until wheat matures. When wheat matures, it produces the seed or the fruit of the plant. And then it's when wheat is mature that you can tell the difference between the wheat and the weeds. We're going to come back to that at the end, what it means when we talk about the wheat maturing and being able to tell the difference at that point between the wheat and the weeds. In this parable, and I'm really only going to talk, I read the parable of the fish too. It's the same lesson, I think. And so I read it, but we're not, I'm not, I'm going to talk about wheat and weeds today, not fish. Don't be a stinky fish. That's the goal. Uh, I'm going to, so we're talking about wheat. Uh, in the other parables that we've looked at, so we looked at the camel and the eye of the needle. What we were to do was get rid of the things in our life that were of more importance than Jesus. There was something to do. When we talked about the ter- parable of the talents, there was something to do. Use the gifts that God gives you. When we talked about the workers in the vineyard, there was something to do. Work in the kingdom. Don't get upset because people are getting paid differently than you, but work in the kingdom. There was something to do in the parable of the, uh, what was the last one? Uh, last week, the unmerciful servant. It was about forgiveness. There was something to do. We are to forgive others. In this morning's parable, there's nothing to do. In fact, the only instruction that Jesus gives in this parable is don't. Just don't. The servants ask, should we separate the weeds and the weeds? And Jesus says, no. Because you're going to do more harm than good. So don't separate them. That's not your job. So don't, don't is the lesson in this parable. In this parable, we see that there's two choices. You can be children of the Son of Man, or you can be children of the enemy, the evil one, the devil. And Jesus just gives us complete permission here to mix metaphors and analogies and just like... He's in the middle of an agricultural analogy, and he goes right into a family analogy, and he doesn't even care that he's mixing them up. We would all just be upset at him. If I did that, you'd probably tell me that, like, stay focused, and I wouldn't. So he's in the middle of this agricultural analogy, and he says to them, you can either be children of the Son of Man, or you can be children of the enemy, the evil one, the devil. And so what that means is you can display the character and quality of one or the other. You can be the child of the son of man, or you can be the, the child of the devil. And what that means, to be a child of, is, means you're part of the same family. You have the same name. You have the same characteristics and quality. The same, the same things make you up. And so Jesus says, you can be this one, or you can be that one. And so I want to talk about that just a little bit so we understand what's being said. Jesus says you can be the children of the Son of Man or you can be the children of the devil. Now, if you look up the Greek word devil in Greek, it's diablo. And the definition of that is slander, accuser, and defamer. Okay? Slander, and cu- accuser, and defamer. And so we have to talk a little bit about what those are. The devil does these things to us, and he wants us in turn to do them to each other, right? He, he, he slanders and accuses and defames us, and he wants us in turn to have the same character and quality that he has. That's who he is. He came to steal and kill and destroy, and to steal life and kill and destroy life and relationships. There's no quicker way to destroy relationships than slander and accusation and defamation. If you don't believe me, try it. Like, go find somebody and slander them. Defa- like, you're not going to have a good relationship with that person. That's what he does. Slander is malicious talk about someone. And so this is the thing that happens. We say things to ourselves like, go ahead, say it. It's true. So in other words, I'm not getting along with someone, and I think they're a jerk. And I'm going to go ahead and say they're a jerk because I, it's okay to be honest. And so if they're a jerk, I'm just going to slay it. But the other thing is, the other reality is that's slander. It's malicious 
talk. Or we say things to ourselves like, that hurt me. They deserve to be hurt as well. Or we say things to ourselves like, the best way to help myself, and we do this so subtly we don't recognize it, the best way to help myself is to bring them down a notch. Watch in the times when people say things that hurt you, how quickly you will turn and say things to them. And that's the same thing that the devil does to us. He wants, to, uh, he wants us to feel that slander. He accuses us. If you're honest, you may have heard yourself or others say these things about you, and then you in turn use them against others. You really blew it. You should feel ashamed. You always do this. You always do this. When are you going to get past this? You aren't worth a whole lot. You don't deserve better. If we're honest, we've heard those voices. And if we're honest, we've probably uh, been that voice for others. And then there's defamation or defaming. And defaming is anyone that damages someone else's reputation. We think by doing this sneakily that we can get away with it. But even when you think poorly of someone else, it's still defamation because you're damaging their reputation, even if it's in your own mind. Every time I remind myself about somebody else's negative character qualities or, and character traits, I'm simply bringing down their reputation in my own mind, own mind, how they're viewed. And when it doesn't matter if you're saying this to someone or behind their back, when you do that, when I talk poorly about someone to someone else, I'm bringing down their reputation in their mind and my own mind. And so that's what this is. And we can take part in that so easily. And that's the character and quality of our enemy, the evil one, the devil. But we can also be children and display the character and quality of the Son of Man. The Son of Man who loves us. The Son of Man who is rich in mercy and abounding in love and quick to forgive and slow to anger. The Son of Man who was given so that we can become part of the family. The Son of Man who pursues us. The Son of Man that invites us in. The Son of Man that in Jesus there is no condemnation. Talk about what happens when we accuse or feel accused. In Jesus, there is no condemnation. You are not guilty. Those things are not held against you. He wants us to be part of his family. Satan is a slanderer, an accuser, and a defamer, but Jesus is a qualifier. He's made you sufficient. He is an inviter. He is a forgiver, and he is a gift giver. And those are just the things from the parables that we've talked about. He is a qualifier. He is an inviter. He is an includer and a gift giver. Now, some of you may be saying, wait a minute, pastor. I've heard the slander and I've heard the accusation and I've heard the defamation. And it came from people who were supposed to be wheat. It came from the church. And if I'd heard those things that you heard, I would probably be upset too. I would probably feel, uh, I would probably have ill will towards the church. But can I, can I tell you something? Wheat and the weeds often look a lot alike. Wheat and the weeds often look a lot alike. We think it's our job as wheat to point out the weeds and make sure that everybody knows exactly who it is and exactly what they did. And so the, the people come to Jesus and they say, should we get rid of the weeds? Should we pull them out? Should we separate them? And Jesus says, don't. Just don't. You do more harm than you do good. Now, now hear me. I'm not saying that there, we shouldn't do things 
There aren't steps to be taken about the wrong things that we see. But what I am saying is it's not your job to separate, and it's not now. It's not your job to separate, and it's not now. We think it's our job to separate. Here's Here's a word we use in the church, heresy. Heresy is, a, heresy is a word that means when somebody deviates from that which is, which is uh, doctrinal or that which is, what's the, orthodox. It's the agreed upon standard. You realize that can only happen in the church? Because outside of the church, it's just what people are doing on Tuesday. There's no agreed upon standard. Jesus is the agreed upon standard. So heresy can only happen in the church. And so we look around and we don't like that and we think we need to do, we need to get rid of this. But while we're pulling this up, we often do more damage than good. And what, what, don't, again, I'm not telling you that there's not right and wrong. There most certainly is. And Jesus most certainly says, I'll deal with that at the end. But it's not for you and not now. And so what do we do? And what I want, what do we do in the meantime? And, and my, my argument this morning is that our go-to, the thing that comes most natural to us is to try to yank it out and separate it out. And that's not what we're to do. Because every time we use slander and accusation and defamation, we're dealing from the devil's hand. And Jesus has a completely different deck of cards and they look a lot different. So what do we do? It is not, I'll get there in a moment. <laughs> Trust me, I'll get there. In, oh, wait, before I get there. Look, this is, the, this is the, one of the most amazing things. When Jesus said, it's not for you to do and it's not now, he said the angels are coming. Think about this. They are weeding out everything in the kingdom that causes sin and all that do evil. We look at passages like this and we focus on the weeping and the gnashing of teeth and we think that God being just and a judge, we don't like that part. Isn't that what we all want? Isn't that what we all long for? That the things that cause sin in my life to be gone and all the things that are, the, the people that are causing evil, isn't evil being gone what we want? And yet we look and God say, no, I don't really want you to be just. That might be because sometimes we look like weeds. They are going to weed out of the kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. I went to that too, too quick. Now you're going to start looking at this stuff and not, not hear the setup. Jesus says in uh, Matthew chapter 7, which is a couple chapters before this, Jesus says, do not judge or you will be judged. That word judge means separate and distinguish. And here's the harm that happens when we separate, when we distinguish, when we make the boundary lines, when we do the, the, the distinguishing and separating and the judging. Here's what happens. We put people off by themselves. I got the chance a couple weeks ago to hear Brene Brown. I always have to give my disclaimer. There's some things in her theology I don't like, but there's a lot of things that I do like. So there, done. She said that as a social species, loneliness is life-threatening. And by social species, that means like people. So us, like it's monkeys and us and maybe some other things. Loneliness is life-threatening. And in fact, we know, and I did some other looking, and this is really easy to find, and I don't need, you don't need Brene Brown to tell you this. Loneliness now, we know that loneliness is, let this sink in for a second. Loneliness is a better indicator of early death than smoking, Diabetes and obesity. I had to look. Smoke, smoking and diabetes and obesity. Loneliness is a better predictor of early death than those things. When we started Eastside eight years ago, 2010, then one in four people in churches on a Sunday morning are lonely. Look around you. Find four people If they don't look lonely, it might be you. And you don't need me to tell you if you are. So you'll see other people that are lonely too. Loneliness is literally killing us as people. 
In a 2013 survey, 57% of American female university students said that they experienced episodes of overwhelming anxiety. Pastor Peter's neighbor is a, is a counselor at JMU. Every week, there are 60 new requests for counseling services at JMU. At JMU, this town right over there. Every week, 60 new requests for counseling services. They can handle 3%. That means that every week there are 58.2 more, more college students than last week who are looking for help in this town. Between 2011, and part of the reason that this statistic is not up there, part of the reason that this statistic is important is 2011 was the year that the population went to over 50% of the population was using a smartphone. And from 2011 to 2015, there's been a 50% increase in clinical depression. In the past 15 years, there's been a 30% increase in teen depression. And in the last 15 years, there's been a 200% increase in the suicide rate in kids 10 to 14. I don't even know how to talk about that. When I was 10, I got my first, like, real bike. And that's the kids that we're talking about. We are not on a good trajectory. The world is not becoming a more welcoming place. And when the church thinks that it's our job to separate and distinguish, we're telling people you're on your own. Last week we talked about forgiveness and Peter comes to Jesus and he says, how many times should I forgive somebody? And Jesus says, 77 times. And numbers are symbolic in Hebrew culture. And that means, what that means is it's complete completeness. And so what Jesus is saying is forgive in complete completeness. In other words, don't, my, my favorite summary of that in a commentary was don't ever give up on anyone. And when we pull out weeds and separate them, what we're doing is saying, I've given up. As the church, we can't do that. We cannot. This is why Jesus says you're going to do more harm than good. Because it's easy to see when you take a moment and think about the harm that's being done. It's easy to see when we separate and distinguish how we are doing more harm than good. I want the things around me to be pure. I want them to be whole. So what do we do? Two summers ago, we, used, we preached through Colossians in the summer, and Colossians 1 has become one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. And Colossians 1 says this, amongst other things. I had to narrow it down to two verses, and I had a hard time. But these two verses relate directly to the parable that we're talking about this morning. Once you were alienated from God, once you were separated, once you were distinguished, once you were set over here, once you were alienated from God, and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, now we, we, we pull back at that and say, well, my behavior wasn't evil. I mean, yes, I lied, but that's not, that's not evil. That's just lying. No, it's the character and quality of the devil. He's an accuser, a slanderer, and a defamer. And we took part in that. Once you were alienated from God, Paul says, and you were enemies because of your character and quality that you were displaying that was like the devil. But now, Jesus has reconciled you. In Christ, we are reconciled. In Christ, we are exchanged. That word means exchange. And it's the word that was used in, in Greek to talk about changing coins from one currency to another. It's like being a dollar bill and you go over this line and now you're a peso. There's been an exchange made in the death of Jesus for us. You were changed from death to life. You were changed from weed to wheat. And this is the important part of this parable. You can go from being a weed to being wheat. And when we separate people out and tell them that they can no longer be wheat, then we've taken away any chance that they have at eternal life because we said so. And Jesus says, don't, just don't separate. That's my job. Can you trust me 
to take care of it. I love the way that these two verses end. These are exactly the opposite characteristics because of Jesus' physical body. Through his death, he presents us holy in his sight. That means set apart. He's the one that's going to set us apart. He's the one that's going to do the separate. Without blemish and free from accusation, all the slander, all the accusation, all the defamation is gone in Jesus. The exact opposite character and quality of the devil. Now, some of you some of you are uncomfortable because you don't know where that leaves us. And that's okay. I'm not sure exactly day to day where that leaves us either. Here's what I do know. Jesus says, I haven't given up on anybody, and neither should you. That's first. Second thing. And I think this can help us in what do we do in the meantime. At the beginning of the parable, I said, or at the beginning of the sermon, I, I said that w- the weeds and the wheat are hard to tell apart until the wheat matures. And then it's easy to tell them apart. They grow the seed, they grow the fruit. In other words, the wheat produces the fruit. We're told in Scripture how to produce fruit right? When the Spirit comes in our lives, these things are evident. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The Spirit works in our lives to conform us to the image of the Son of Man. Jesus told his disciples that if you want to produce fruit, then abide in me. Make your home in me. Your go-to is not slander and defamation and accusation. Your go-to is me. Your go-to is home, and I am home. Your go-to is spending time with me. That's why it's so important that we look at these parables, because we see the character and quality of Jesus displayed in these parables. It's why it's important that you spend time reading the Word, because you see the character and quality of Jesus. Make your home there. That's how we produce fruit. That's how the weeds begin to look differently, or I'm sorry, that's how the wheat begins to look differently than the wheat. Go to Jesus We have to return to the gospel. We have to return to the fact that Jesus is a qualifier, that he is a gift giver, a forgiver, and an includer. And we have to stop trying to rip things up so that they're gone and giving up on others. I'm not telling you that there's not right and wrong. I'm telling you that there is a way for you to mature. And that's what we're called to do. Go to Jesus. Let him, trust him enough to know that he can take care of making sure that this harvest is pure. He can take care of making sure that the weeds are where they're supposed to be and the wheat's where they're supposed to be. Go to Jesus and then our lives begin to display these characteristics, these qualities that are him. And if we can keep ourselves from separating the people that we think need to be separated, if we're displaying those characters and qualities, not only are they going to be attracted to us, but we're going to be running to them and saying, let me show you the Son of Man. Let me show you this Jesus that has qualified me, that has transformed me, that has reconciled me. And I think he'd like to do that with you too. There will be people at the back. The worship team can come on back up. There will be people at the back to pray. And maybe you know this morning when when we ask you to go pray, I want to give you reasons why you might pray with someone. You know that you've been separating people. Maybe you're just believing the lies that you are separated and you you can't possibly be included in God's family. But I, I want to tell you, you can. Because Jesus is a qualifier. Or maybe... You simply want to know more about this Son of Man who, who, will, uh, who will include you, who will give you gifts, who will qualify you. And I want to keep asking you this question. You're going to get tired of me asking, and it's okay. Who is your one? You know somebody that feels separated. 
you know somebody who is alone. You know somebody who is dealing with all of those things that we talked about. There is help for them. Will you be help for them? Would you pray with me? God, as we, uh, as we take a moment to reflect on your word, Lord, I, man, I am guilty so often of separating people out. I'm guilty of turning my heart against them instead of towards them because I don't, I, I don't want them to be part of the family. And ultimately, Lord, I know that that is not your character and your quality. So, Lord, would you forgive us? Would you help us to see you? Lord, help us to make our home in you. Help us to abide in you. You love us. There is no condemnation in Jesus. We are free. We are without blemish and free from accusation because of the gift of Jesus to us. Both what he taught, what he said, what he did. Lord, his death and shed blood on a cross and his resurrection and the fact that he gives us his spirit to guide us, Lord. Because of all that, we can be without blemish and free from accusation. No charge leveled against us carries any significance because of Christ. So Lord, would you help us to come to you? Would you help us to abide in you? Lord, in moments when we're tempted to separate, may we return to you. Lord, would you change our hearts so that others can see that they can be changed as well. Lord, we ask this in your name and your character and quality and your strength, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen.